Hi, legal team. Ceci and I are incredibly busy, as most of you all are, as it gets towards the end of the year. So we're having a difficult time scheduling and figuring out times to record at the same time. But I promise we will be back to that soon in the new year. In the meantime, we've been recording many episodes, and I already recorded one with John. But full disclosure, we were both drinking and having a bit of a good time with that as we were recording. So I'm going to save that part for the end of the episode. And I am going to give you some more substance and law at the beginning of the recording. So what we were talking about was Sutton's divorce. We've all seen on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills how Sutton went through a very high asset divorce and how things were split up. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the procedures that go into that and some of the interesting things that come about in high asset divorces, which most of us will never have to deal with. So as I talk about all of this stuff that I'm about to go over, community property, separate property, and then a lot of the ways that people attempt to hide assets in a divorce, I think it'll help put into context some of the things that Sutton says in her various interviews and on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. To start, let's go over some basics. And I'm going to keep this to the basics of California divorce. First, you need to understand separate and community property. These are important to know because this is how a court will decide how to divide your property. In general, you get to keep separate property and then you have to split community property. Community property, put simply, is just what you own and owe together during a marriage. Separate property is what you each own or owe individually from before you married or after you separated and any gifts or inheritance. So to determine what's community property or separate property, you have to know when you were married and then the date of separation. A lot of couples disagree on what the actual separation date is. The date of your marriage is easy to figure out. That's on your marriage certificate. The date of separation. That can be defined as the day that one person in the marriage let the other person know by actions or words that you wanted to end the marriage. And then after that day, your actions have to be consistent with wanting to end your marriage. So if you tell your husband you want a divorce, but then you go on living together and acting as if nothing happened, it's going to be hard if he contests that date to say that that was your date of separation. For a lot of people, the date of separation is the day that they move out. But if it's an amicable divorce, you can agree that the marriage is over and that you made plans to divorce on a specific date. So from the date of separation, what you or your spouse earned or any loans or anything else you took out, those are no longer community property. That's why that date is so important. So back to community property. Community property is anything you earned while married, anything you bought with money you earned while married, or debt that you took on while married. Generally, property that you didn't earn, like a gift or inheritance, one of you received while married, is not community property. And one thing a lot of people don't realize is that retirement or pension plans are probably community property and that you may have the right to part of that money in the plan if any of you earned it during the marriage. You also may have more debts than you realize. Your spouse might have debt only in their name that you don't know about, but unfortunately, these debts belong to both of you. So let's look at a mortgage. If you take a mortgage out to buy a house while you're married, that debt is community property. You're both responsible for it. However, if you buy a car with money that only you earned while married, the car is community property, even though the money used to pay for it was earned by you and not your spouse. It doesn't matter if only you drive it. Back to separate property. Generally, separate property is anything you buy with separate property or you earn from separate property, or it's gifts or inheritance to one of you even if it was given or inherited while you were married. Separate property belongs only to you as long as it was kept separately. Keeping it separately means you didn't give it to your spouse. Let's take our simple examples again. Let's say you had a car from before you got married. Then you got married, and you sold the car and used all that money and no other money to buy a different car. That car is your separate property even though you bought it while married. Another example, let's say you took a vacation after your agreed-upon date of separation and you charge that vacation to your credit card. This is your separate debt because it was after the date of separation. But then there's the issue of commingling, and that just means that the separate property and community property got mixed together. This often happens with big purchases, retirement plans, and bank accounts. 
So here's an example of commingling. One spouse uses money they earned before they were married as a down payment on a house. The down payment for the house is separate property. The married couple then uses money they're both earning to make the mortgage payments. This means that the payments are made using community property. So the equity or value resulting from paying down the house is community property. The equity in the house is now part community and part separate property. Going back to retirement plans, that's another example of how things can be commingled. So let's say one spouse has a retirement benefit from a job, and they had that job since before they were married. The contributions made into the plan before the marriage are separate property. And then the contributions made while married are community property. And then after you separate, the new contributions are separate property. So even with these really simple examples, you can already see how complicated this can get with just a normal circumstance. But what we're talking about here is Sutton's divorce. And on Watch What Happens Live in 2020, Sutton revealed that she didn't know the full extent of her now ex-husband's job and their finances while they were married. Quote, it's true because he was in charge of the finances. I didn't know everything. So when you do get the full disclosure and get everything, I was like, what? It's actually two minor league baseball teams. I knew we had a timber company, but I didn't know all. There was like 10 things on there. I was like, wow, I'm rich. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what had to happen in order for Sutton to find those things out. And when you have a really high net worth divorce, some of the things that go into it. So one of the first things, for example, the things that Sutton knew about, one of the first things that has to happen is asset valuation. And that can be a really complicated process when dealing with substantial assets like business interests, stocks, real estate, or an art collection, for example, or in Sutton's case, a minor league baseball team. And in order to do that type of asset valuation, you have to get professionals beyond legal representation. So that means appraisers, financial advisors, and accountants who can help you and your lawyer figure out how to accurately value assets and fight for a fair division. Now, if the divorce is one where the parties are pretty much in agreement on things, that can make it a lot easier. Otherwise, you have to hire experts for each side and they have to value the assets and then lay out the reasons for their opinions as to why the assets are a certain value. And then a judge decides. Just imagine how difficult that is if you have a couple of Picassos, a Rembrandt, some baseball teams, various businesses. If you can't agree, that means that it's up to the court and the experts to duke it out as to what those things are worth. And that's just the asset valuation for the assets that you know about. A lot of times in high net worth divorces, some parties may attempt to hide assets to prevent them from being considered in the divorce. Uncovering these hidden assets often requires a forensic accountant, which if you watch The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, you know that Sutton got a forensic accountant. Now, I'm not saying that Sutton's husband was hiding assets, but because it was so high value, she probably would have had to have a forensic accountant either way. But let's say someone is hiding assets. What are some of the things that you look for? One thing people do when they try to hide assets is purchase an incredibly expensive item that could be easily overlooked. Let's say your spouse has a new rug in their office and it looks kind of old and you've never seen it before, but you don't really think twice about it. Well, it could be an incredibly expensive Persian rug, for example, the Clark Sickle Leaf Carpet, it's a 17th century Persian masterpiece. It was initially estimated around 10 million, but then when it was sold, it was auctioned off for 33.7 million at Sotheby's auction in 2013. And I mean, it's a pretty rug, but if you just look at it and you didn't know it was that expensive, you would have no idea. And when you're dividing up the assets in the divorce, your spouse says, oh, I'll take the rug. And you don't think twice about it, not knowing that it's worth millions of dollars. So that's one way, purchasing items that could be easily overlooked or undervalued. Another way spouses can try to hide assets is stashing money. And I'm not just talking about stashing money in a safe deposit box. I'm talking about offshore domestic asset protection trusts. 
So your high-value divorcing spouse may be hiding assets in an offshore trust. So a trust, not the person, technically owns the assets placed within that trust. And your spouse may stealthily transfer marital assets into that offshore trust. They could also make new purchases through an offshore trust. Real estate, cars, jewelry, boats, anything you think of can be bought in the name of a trust. Doing this keeps your spouse's name off of any title. And according to Samuelson House PLLC, a New York divorce and custody firm, a Cook Islands trust is especially popular because it allows the person establishing the trust to also be the beneficiary while the assets are protected from creditors and others. According to that same firm, your spouse does not have to ship off money to a foreign land in an effort to protect money in a divorce. Apparently, many wealthy people are using South Dakota to shield part of their fortune. Trusts in most states can exist only for a certain amount of time before the asset has to be liquefied. But in South Dakota, apparently, trusts have no expiration, so assets can continue to be protected and accumulate value indefinitely. Another way spouses try to hide assets in a divorce or if they know a divorce is imminent, is by under-reporting income on tax returns or financial statements. Because if it's not reported, it can't be used in a financial analysis. That's a really bad idea for a lot of reasons. Don't do that. And another thing people do is they overpay the IRS or creditors. So if your spouse overpays, he or she can get the refund later after the divorce is final. That is so sneaky. Some people also create phony debt. Your spouse can collude with family members or friends to establish phony loans or expenses. Then they can make payments to the family members or friends, knowing that they'll get the money back after the divorce is final. This stuff might sound crazy to you guys, but these are all from real life examples of things that people have done to try to hide money from their spouse. Sometimes people set up accounts in the name of a child using the child's social security number. That's also done with a girlfriend or mistress's social security number making it really difficult to locate the account. Then, of course, there's always cryptocurrency. Because cryptocurrency is not in a bank, but it's in a ledger system on a computer network that is secured through encryption technology. I mean, the whole purpose of cryptocurrency is that it's meant to be anonymous, which makes it incredibly challenging to track. And it's a digital asset that exists outside the control of governments and central authorities. So how do you figure this stuff out? Obviously, some of this stuff is way easier to figure out prior to the filing of divorce while you still share a home and while you still have access to things. So, I mean, look for cryptocurrency exchange apps on your shared cell phone plan. Observe patterns of bank withdrawals. Watch for unusual gifts to your friends or family. Notice if they're suddenly becoming more secretive, if things are suddenly locked up and they weren't before. With these types of assets, you have to have a forensic accountant to uncover these things. And the forensic accountant will go through bank records, tax returns, loan documents, court filings, insurance policies, and everything else they can think of to expose assets that are not properly disclosed. One good way to discover assets I have found in the practice of law is to look at loan applications. So now that I've given you a little legal substance and some actual information, I am going to present to you the somewhat unhinged episode that John and I recorded together a few days ago when we were drinking. What I thought at the time was Dorinda's bourbon, which for the record, I have had, and it is delicious. It just wasn't the bourbon I was drinking at the time. It's really good bourbon. So if you learn nothing else from the rest of this episode, you'll see what happens when you drink Dorinda's bourbon. Hello, legal team. I'm here with John. John, do you want to say hi? Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Okay, I'm going to be really honest here. John and I are sitting here. It's late in the evening, and we have Dorinda's Bluestone Manor bourbon, which, by the way, is delicious. I got it for John as a present when I was at BravoCon in Las Vegas. John, you are a bourbon connoisseur. What do you think of Dorinda's bourbon? I really enjoyed the bourbon. Uh, so much so that actually I believe the bourbon you're drinking has been replaced with fake bourbon because I drank all of that bourbon and I didn't want you to know that. So I poured uh, Woodford Reserve into the bottle. No, you did not. Yeah, I did because I drank it all. and Because it was so good. Really? Yeah, I really did. Are was, you serious? It was that good and I just couldn't stop having a sip of it every night. And so that's Woodford Reserve that I actually poured into the bottle 
Wait, are you serious? I'm dead serious. No, I'm not joking. Oh, no. I, I drink that. It's my gift. I like wood preserve. That's why I drink regularly. I poured that into the fancy bottle, which is a beautiful bottle of oil. It has like a key on it. it has a beautiful topped cork you pull off. Well, it's a blue like glass. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. And I poured Woodford Reserve into it so that my wife would not be suspect of me for drinking it all. You know what? I actually think Dorinda would be very proud of you for that, and she would approve. I really do feel like that's a reality star move. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of, I feel like it's, I, I wasn't going to share that with you, by the way, until we started recording. I was going to hope, I was waiting for you to sip it and see if you could tell the difference. I don't drink bourbon very often. I know, often. that's why I did it, and that's why I figured that I'd be safe. Are you sure? This one smells like the maple that is in Dorinda's bourbon. I promise you, that is all gone. Are you serious? <laughs> You're really serious right now. I'm dead serious. Dead serious. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. Well, this is not how I was expecting the beginning of this podcast to go. Dorinda, if you're listening, your bourbon is very good. You could not have a better endorsement than from my husband. And we are not getting compensated for this. And by the way, I've paid full price for that bourbon at BravoCon, had it shipped here, and apparently my husband already drank all of it. Well, let me just say, that was one of the reasons why I refilled the bottle. It was a gift to me. Angela like had bought it. We don't need to. We don't need to. And I'm like, wow, this is a beautiful gift. And literally, like, Two days later, the bottle is gone. Drink that whole bur- bottle of bourbon in two days. It was he's exaggerating. Three days. No, later. it was John. Five days later. BravoCon was quite some time ago. Anyway, it was gone in a period of time that was acceptable. Can we just move on from this? Yes. Okay, we're moving on from this. My husband is not an alcoholic. It's just during his bourbon is really good. So the next thing I wanted to bring up after this surprising sidetrack that I wasn't expecting is I have a very close friend who is an attorney, and she wrote children's books. And they're really, really good, and so I want to recommend them. Her name is Allison Bayless. That's B-A-Y-L-E-S. And she has several books, and they are adorable children's books. They are absolutely perfect if you are shopping for children this Christmas. And I will post something on our Instagram about them because it's just amazing. And she accomplished a dream of publishing children's books, and they're really cute. So. No, I think that's incredible. And being somebody who makes art, I'm approached so often by people that want to do a children's book, and I so often ignore them and turn them down. I'm so proud that somebody just got it done. To be clear, she did not ask John to do this. No, she did not. John had nothing to do with this. And I'm actually a little mad about that. What, you wanted to tell her no, that you wouldn't do illustrations? Well, now that she succeeded, now... Oh my God, stop. Okay, I miss Ceci. Anyway, <laughs> Ceci, come back. All right, so we're going to talk about Sutton Strack and her divorce. And she had a very expensive divorce, and she managed to get a lot of things in the divorce, and it's an interesting divorce. So we're going to talk about some of that. But first, John, would you please read Sutton's bio on bravotv.com? Sure, I can do this. Was this written by Sutton? Or is this just a bio? I don't know. I'm assuming like a Bravo copy editor or something. Okay, so okay. I'm not going to read it in Sutton. Well, she, I, some, if someone were going to do that, it would be me, and I'd have to get out my actual Southern accent, which I hide constantly. Oh, by the way, Bravo Docket legal team, I've gotten a couple comments about how it's annoying that Angela laughs after sentences that aren't funny. And first of all, how dare you get mad at me for laughing? I have... You know, small moments of joy in my life as an attorney, and I enjoy laughing. But second of all, the reason for that is it's typically because I have said something in my Southern accent and then had to repeat it several times to try to say it without the accent. So by the time I finally say it correctly, I'm usually laughing at myself, and that's what that is from. But no, you do not need to read this in any sort of accent. Just in in your nice John normal voice that everyone loves, will you please read Sutton's bio? Born and raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Born and raised in Augusta, Georgia, Sutton is a Southern debutante turned Beverly Hills socialite. In her early 20s, Sutton moved to New York as an aspiring professional ballet dancer. She eventually became the Cunningham Dance Foundation's Director of Development and the Augusta Ballet's Executive Director. Sutton sits on various boards in New York, Los Angeles, and Augusta, including the prestigious American Ballet Theater. She was also named a top party host in America alongside Oprah and Michelle Obama. Sutton married childhood friend Christian in the year 2000, and they have three children together, daughter Porter and sons Philip and James. Sutton and Christian divorced several years ago, and she's making the most of her newfound freedom. Her West Hollywood boutique, Sutton, recently celebrated its fourth anniversary. 
Sutton is never far from her southern roots, as evidenced by her recent spur-of-the-moment purchase of a Frisian horse. Uh, I want to emphasize the fact that she was named a top party host in America alongside Oprah and Michelle Obama. Was that meaningful to you, John? I mean, in my opinion, there is no harder job, really, in the world. And also, I'm thankful that she is now free from the hard life she led John, before this and is now able to live her true life. Oh, my God. Helping with the ballet and with parties, etc. What did you say? Helping with what? The ballet. That's ballet in our terms. But when I watched that movie, that was the Irish movie about the ballet dancer kit. And they were in Ireland. They said the ballet. And I can never get that out of my head. So I always say ballet now. You are truly unhinged today. I'm always unhinged, Dan. I'm glad Sutton Strack finally found. Okay, John, that's enough. All right. So moving moving on. So this is a picture, John, of Sutton in a debutante gown at a debutante ball. Wait, did, did, don't pipe up yet. And that's her dad. That's not. Okay. Because I knew. Right. I was about to be like, wait a second. So she's 14 and he's 55. Okay, good. I'm, no, no, no. no. That's, okay, no that's, that's her. her dad and her. Okay. That's Sutton in 1990 with her dad. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Then I have no comment. I will say her dad does, when you see, when I've got pictures in here for you of her ex-husband, and her dad does look a whole lot like her husband. This is her wedding day, correct? No, this is her on her, this is at a debutante ball. Isn't Why it? is she in a wedding dress? Because that's a debutante gown. That's what Debbie, that looks like a wedding dress. Well, that's what they wear. They wear white dresses and they're debutantes. Uh, I was confused. See, me too. And Ceci isn't here to stop us from going off on an ADHD tangent. So here we go. Okay. I was really curious about Sorry. debutantes. So <laughs> apparently it's based on an 18th century ritual of families introducing their young daughters, all prim and proper, into a class restricted marriage market. And debutante balls have become, in recent decades, this is, by the way, from a 1997 New York Times article, debutante balls have become, in recent decades, more of a networking tool for parents to socially connect and escalate both their daughters and themselves. This is also from the 1997 New York Times article, quote, it's just like preschool in New York. It's not about the kids, it's about the parents. And in 1997, the cost for a single event, I guess for a single debutante, can run over $10,000. But again, that's way back in 1997. Right. So Sutton talked about in an article what she learned from her debutante season. And John, I would like you to read this. This is Sutton saying this, all right? Yes, but you don't need to do an accent or anything. Just read it like read it like a normal person, like yourself, with your nice John voice that everyone likes. Sutton said that she learned a lot from her debutante season, including the art of place card seating, which she said was probably my biggest takeaway. Something that would come in handy later on when she served as the Director of Development for the Mercy Cunningham Dance Company in New York. We would do big galas, you know, for like 600 people. And in New York society, that is a very difficult task to do gala seating for New York socialites, and they take it super seriously. Sutton recalled, And as daunting as it was, I would sit there with our gala chair and I got it. I was not nearly as intimidated as one should have been as, you know, a 25-year-old, 26-year-old young woman entering this New York socialite world. But I was like, okay, we've got this, and doing it kind of eased me into the job. So, yeah, I appreciate my debutante days after that. Okay, John read that in somewhat of a mocking tone. But to be clear, I mean... These people do take their seating arrangements very seriously, and I do think that this is probably excellent preparation for being on a Real Housewives show. Let me just preface. Let me just say something. Not preface, because we already talked. I actually uh, do. I do see the value in what she's saying. I, I said that in a mocking tone. I did read it that way, but that's just because I was in the moment. But I actually understand what she's saying. So I'm not. I don't. I don't want to be a shit talker here. I, I see the value. Okay. So this next picture is of Sutton and her husband that she eventually divorces. And I just want you to look at this and then look at the picture of her with her dad. Don't they have some similarities? We see the uh, picture you were talking about earlier. No, they do not. They're men. They're men. That's all they are. They're, they have no similarities. Zero. Sorry. No, they look very similar. No, I, I see zero similarity. Let me go back to the original dad. Let me see that again. 
Okay, wait, but wait, I have pictures of him. I have pictures yeah, of her well, husband yeah, when I, he's I, older. Hold on, hold on. See there? Doesn't he look like... Well, you know, okay, I guess I can see it there. So I I used my New York Times subscription and I found... Wait, we have a New York Times subscription? Yeah. I didn't know. Well, just to like the web version. I mean, with the amount I spend on the horse, I didn't think I needed to tell you about the New York Times subscription. We have so many. All right. I do not know how to pronounce this man's actual first name, and I'm I'm curious if you do. Tybalt. Really? That's Tybalt? Yeah, it's Tybalt. Like from Shakespeare? Yeah, I think it's Tybalt. That's not how Shakespeare spelled. I don't think it's, I think it's Tybalt. Well, I don't, that's from Shakespeare, right? Yeah, that's Tybalt. Romeo and Juliet. Okay, it's not spelled the same way, though. Anyway, Sutton Thurman Brown. And Tybalt Christian Strack were married yesterday. This is, again, from their wedding announcement in the New York Times by the Reverend Charles D. Ronson at the Central Presbyterian Church in New York. Ms. Strack, 28, is the Associate Director of Development in charge of fundraising for the Cunningham Dance Foundation in New York. She graduated from Converse College in Spartansburg, South Carolina. Her parents, Reba and John T. Brown, live in Augusta, Georgia, where her father is an architect in private practice and her mother is a social worker for the Veterans Administration. Mr. Strack, also 28, is known as Christian. He is a strategist in Latin American currency and was a Peace Corps volunteer from 1992 to 1994, working on the edge of the Sahara Desert, where he taught tree planting and anti-erosion techniques. His parents, Claire Strack and Dr. Richard Strack, also live in Augusta. The bridegroom's mother teaches Spanish at the Davidson Fine Arts High School in Augusta, where he and the bride met as students. His father is an English professor at Augusta State University. Was that normal in wedding announcements to talk about what, what the parents did no. and stuff? I mean, probably it is for really rich people. I've been married uh, before you. I was married in a more traditional actual wedding wedding. You and I did not have a wedding. No, we did. We got married in Las Vegas, and it yeah, was awesome. Yeah, we had our, we had our wedding. Yeah, it was great. I before. Ten of ten recommend. But my practice marriage, as I like to call it, was the more traditional one, and it was just invites sent out, and there was nothing celebrating our parents. So it was not like my father. But I think it was a thing that if you're like a fancy person and rich. Well, no, here's how it works, though. Here's my theory on this, because if it, I did, say I did it in my. That one wedding I had that doesn't count of the practice marriage, right? My dad is a doctor, right? My dad is a doctor and is very successful. As yes, a no, you were a rich person and I'm from the swamp and I'm a garbage Exactly. Person. First of all, let's get that straight. <laughs> I am from a pedigree that oh Angela is not. Uh, she is more of the, I rescued her from. You didn't, oh my God. Uh, a, 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 like a, a swampy sort of quicksand. If you will, I, I pulled her from the muck. I think the society people that are all at the same level all do this. Like, I don't think that's why I'm saying that's why I'm saying it's weird. And that, but you managed to bring that, that up by saying me and your ex wife are both garbage people compared to you. Oh, yes. Well, no, <laughs> let me get back to that. Yes, I we're done. With this. <laughs> okay, so her ex husband, Mr. Strack, I looked him up, I was trying to figure out some things out about him. It says he is currently a managing director and the global head of the credit research group based in the London office. And then as president, he oversees international operations outside of the Americas, including strategy, expanding distribution, and scaling the private strategies platform. None of that makes sense to me. No, I, that's why I do that on a daily basis in my job. I understand that. Okay, if you do that, then I'm buying another horse. I do that. But I don't I'm going to open up a it. store as well. I do it. Okay. I, I want everyone out there in America to know Tell that I, that's what I do. No, no, no. That's not what you do. Okay. Mr. Strack is a senior portfolio manager and a mm -hmm. member of various committees. And anyway, something else. Oh, across. Yeah. That's what I do. Okay. Alternative credit and private strategies platform. In addition to his portfolio management responsibilities, he sits on the firm's executive committee. Okay. Anyway, yeah. this is a bunch of like... No, this is that's an average... Record. This is a bunch of rich white people stuff no, that I don't... Okay. That. Anyway. Yes. All right. So going on to this. So on September 22nd, 2016, Christian Strack filed for divorce. Sutton's birthday is September 20th. Oof. That's bad. Wait, what? What's bad? Okay. Sutton's birthday. So Sutton talked about on The Real Houses of Beverly Hills about how he called her and told her that she needed to get a lawyer. He called her on her birthday. And she did not know it was coming and told her she needed to get a lawyer. So he filed for divorce on September 22nd, 2016. 
and her birthday is September 20th. So he called her on September 20th, told her she needed to get a lawyer and then on her birthday and then filed for divorce two days later. So it says Sutton and Christian did not agree on the separation date in the legal pleadings. He claimed the date of separation was May 31st, 2016, and Sutton stated it happened later on. And if she was ambushed with it, I would I would say that's probably right. It probably did actually happen later on. No, wait. I'm sure this is already in here. You have to- I, I know. I realize I keep backing away like I'm – I apologize. I'm talking into the microphone. Before we get any deeper than this. I actually feel like you're possessed by Dorinda at this point. Who's Dorinda? She's the one that made the bourbon that you drank all of, apparently. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. <laughs> oh, my God. You start telling me you made it nice, we're gonna have a problem. I am curious. Does before we go into all this, was a prenup signed? No, because they got married. As they get, they were no prenup signed because they were high school. They were high school sweethearts. No, she's. It was her childhood. Like she high school, but they didn't start dating till high school. But like she'd known him since she was a child. Their families had known each other. They've been friends. So high school sweethearts. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they didn't sign a prenup. They did she not didn't realize that he was gonna become. But his family is already rich and already super fancy. Right? I, it looks like it, yeah. So she married into a super fancy family. And her family, was she super fancy when I she mean, married into it? Her father was an architect and her mother was a social worker for the... No, so no, she was not super fancy. She married into a super fancy family. Well, okay, but he still didn't have all of that wealth and then made it while they were married. No, his parents already had the wealth. Not as, not as much. Okay, listen, just... Look. Okay, I'll stop. I'll back off. Thank you. Dorinda, I'm just calling you. Do you feel this way, but I'll back off. Dorinda, stop giving me the housewives apology. I'm sorry I made you feel that way. I'm sorry I made you feel that way. Okay, this is really going to incense you. So let's just read what she got for spousal support here. So I'm already incensed by the word by of spousal support. Spousal support. No, just don't. Stop. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm doing it right now. No commentary. No commentary, spousal support. Petitioner shall pay to respondent as and for... Wait, wait, wait. Christian shall pay to Sutton, as and for taxable spousal support, the sum of $300,000 per month payable on the first day of each month, commencing on the first day of January 2019, and continuing each month thereafter until Christian's death, Sutton's death, the remarriage of Sutton, or the registration as a domestic partner by Sutton, whichever first occurs. Christian shall have the right but not obligation to prepay one or more months of this spousal support, blah, blah, blah. So she gets $300,000 a month in spousal support. So I tried reading that first, and I was doing it fast. But I was trying to give it some drama, and that's crazy. I mean, is that crazy? Am I wrong for thinking that's crazy, Angela, that that's a crazy amount that somebody would get? Out of it? No, because of how rich he is, it's not crazy. Right, but at the same time, he's rich. She's not. No, well, she's she, going to get. She married. We are going to fight over this. No, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. She fight. she married him. He didn't let her work. He didn't let her do anything but take care of the children. So no, wait she, a second. You're telling me he didn't let her work. She talks about how he didn't want her working outside the home. He didn't want her doing anything but taking care of the children. So her life revolved around him and the children's lives. So she gave up all of that time that she could have been doing other things. Like he did not want her to work. Okay, that's different. That's the case. I totally accept it. Cool. Okay, so Christian also has to pay, in addition to the $300,000 a month, $50,000 every month in child support. In addition to $300,000, he's paying $50,000 Well, legally, those are separate things. He's paying $350,000 a month at this point in time for her. And how many kids does she have? Three. So three kids, $50,000 a month. Well, that's Plus the... just her existing $300,000 a month. Look, we're expensive. And she has a horse now to take care of. So, Actually, that I mean, you said that like actually like as a joke. But is that actually brought into this? No, she didn't buy the horse until very recently. They share joint physical and legal custody of the kids. And then it says Christian set up a $3 million trust for their children and is going to add to it. And then it also says that they split their art collection, including the pieces in storage. And I got this from an article. And Sutton also got a home in Georgia and one in Los Angeles. And then she was also given a lump sum payment of $1,235,000 in three vehicles, a Range Rover, a Cadillac, and a Chevy Suburban. She also got to keep her jewelry, couture clothing, and her Andy Warhol prints. So ladies out there, this is the lottery. She works. This is what you're fighting for. Try to get this as much as you can. This is the what I if I was a woman, if I as a guy, I would actually 
go for this. This is a great deal. I would fight for this. If you divorce me, you're not getting it. I right. would leave you. <laughs> <laughs> and you would leave me too, and you know it. You would, would totally do it. You're turning into Jerry Seinfeld. I know. I'm sounding like Seinfeld. Why are you turning into... Yep. Stop. Okay. Anyway, I wonder what Andy Warhol she has. I haven't seen them. Like They can't I, I, really show I, them on the show. Here's my guess. It's... Uh, Stop, stop. Eight. This episode's already a disaster. Okay. No, this is the best episode that's ever happened. You're totally turning into Dorinda. Um, I apologize that you feel that way. Oh, my God. Stop. All right. Wait. It, you can't look at this now because I have a quiz. Okay. I have a quiz. And we're just going to have to pass the microphone back and forth. All right. I'm going to read you the names of some famous divorces and what they got in the divorces. Okay. So don't – hold on. Don't look at this. Here's my – I'm, I'm going to give you one really initial guess on this one. Uh, None of the ones that lost are women. Am I correct in that one? Okay, we're cutting this. So. <laughs> no women lost in the divorce. Madonna actually paid a lot, but I didn't put no, her in Madonna, her. I, Madonna. She paid a ton to Guy Ritchie. Madonna's probably. Uh, I'm going to read you the name of three people, and I want you to tell me of these three people who paid more in their divorce okay. settlement. Okay. So we're going to start with Donald Trump, Kevin Costner, and Phil Collins. Of those three people... Who paid more in their divorce? I guess Kevin Costner. Okay, so Donald Trump paid $25 million to Ivana Trump. Phil, Phil Collins paid $68 million in his divorce settlement. And Kevin Costner, and this is his first one because his second divorce isn't finalized yet. Oh, and his yeah. Guess how much? Guess, just guess how many million Kevin Costner? Million. $80 million. Is that right? No, you said $50 million. Uh, yeah, Kevin Costner, you, you got that right. Let this be a lesson uh, to all the men listening to this podcast right now. Stop. I'm cutting this out. Uh, sign a prenup. Uh, it's really important. I'm learning uh, okay, from Kevin good. Costner. I, I think, I, Angela, I'm not saying this as an anti- oh, I'm starting to think I should have made you sign a prenup. Yeah, actually, I'm looking forward to thankfully <laughs> dealing fucking all your money down the line. Yeah, good That's luck. That's my goal. It'll do Italian divorce and see how that works out for you. Well, I, one day. Okay, just don't look. Don't look. Okay. Don't look. I'm looking this way. Well, Harrison Ford. Okay, yeah, but you didn't see the amount, right? Okay. All right, so for these three people, Michael Jordan, Dr. Dre, and Harrison Ford, which one of those three people had the most expensive divorce of the three? Michael Jordan, Dr. Dre, and Harrison Ford? Yes. I got to give that one to Michael Jordan. Michael J., he's always best. Okay, so Harrison Ford, $85 million. After 21 years of marriage to, I think it was his childhood's weird. I'm not sure. $85 million. Uh, Dr. Dre, after being married for 24 years, paid $100 million. Holy cannoli, that's a lot. And then Michael Jordan paid $168 million. I'm so good at reading uh, how this is. You know what? I didn't think I had a talent. Okay. Honestly. All right. And I realize that my talent now is realizing how people people this. are going to be ripped off during you're, this. Deal. You're, not, not man or woman, just people. You're good at so many things. This is nonsense. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm ready for the next one. Okay. Well, the, I'm not going to ask the next one. I just want you to guess these. Okay. How much do you think Mel Gibson paid? Oh, for his divorce? $80 million. Not even close. $100 million. Not even close. $150 million. Not even close. $200 million. Okay, we're going to stop. So according to this article by People, which is really fun, and it's called The Most Expensive Divorces, Google it because I didn't go through all of them in here, and it was written by Diana Pearl and Diane Cho, and it's a recent article from People Magazine. According to this article, Mel Gibson divorced after 30 years of marriage, and he split half of his $850 million fortune with... His at now ex wife settlement totaling four hundred and twenty five million. Yeah, he split it with her. Actually, that's pretty noble. I don't think he did that voluntarily. I bet you he did. I bet you he did. Okay, yeah. Four hundred and fifty million dollars in the split hairs. That guy was probably like, "I'll give you a fucking half." I'm. You were here for it. I'm for cutting this out. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. How much do you think Jeff Bezos paid in his divorce? Why well, not? She's like one of the. She's one of the richest women in the world now, right? So what, like uh, two billion dollars or something? No, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what? What? How much does she make? How much does she make? Wait, you thought it was only two billion? Well, you know, billion. Look, I am still in a world where I 
when I get a thousand dollars, I am excited by that. Oh my god, this oh. is such a hot mess. Okay, she walked away with thirty six billion. Oh, so not okay. So if I got a billion, I wouldn't even be on this list. Honestly, I would be well, no. not even part of the list of like John earned a billion from the divorce with Angela. I, I wouldn't even be on the goddamn list. No, you. It offends me, honestly. No, okay, I'm cutting that out too. Why? Well, good. That's golden. No, because we just talked about how they have like 25 million. Anyway, okay, I have an ex- I have another question for you. If you went out on a date with a woman and she was wearing a cat sweater, a blue sweater with a really cute white cat on it, would you be turned off by that? No. Yeah, I know. Cat sweaters are awesome. No, what? I wouldn't be turned off by the cat sweater at all. Thank you. Thank you, legal team. And I think the lesson that you learned from this, it was a little light on the law, but you got a fair warning about the powers of Dorinda's bourbon. And you learned a little bit about how expensive divorce can be. And remember, the most important thing you can do is find somebody that is on the track of success and marry truly on. And when they're 10 years in and succeeded, that's when it's time for you to leave and become fireworks. That's John. That's me signing off for the night. Okay. Thank thank you, legal team, for your patience. We really appreciate this. And I uh, hope you enjoy this very lighthearted episode and don't take it too seriously. This is very serious. Take it seriously. Okay, stop. Oh, my God. We're out of control. All right. Thanks, legal team.